The topic of the talk tonight is why the three weeks are not what we think. The three weeks are not what they seem. Now, I just want to clarify before we start because that can be taken the wrong way. You know, sometimes, especially with something like this, we know that the three weeks, Ben Amitsarim, Shivasabatamus, Tishabov, is a very serious time and it's a, a time in which the saddest things in Jewish history happened. And this is reflected in halacha. You know, there's a reason why we don't listen to music. There's a reason why we don't get haircuts. There's a reason why in the nine days we don't eat meat or drink wine, etc. Because terrible things did happen during these three weeks. And, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it can sort of seem like we're just trying to brush that off and just be like, ah, it's not what it seems. It's really all, you know, unicorns and rainbows. And, and hopefully where we'll get to by the end of this class, the end of this talk is that maybe it is unicorns and rainbows at the same time as we will acknowledge that there's a reason why Halacha tells us that we behave the way that we behave during the three weeks and during the nine days and bad things did happen and it is a time of sadness. But at the same time, as we acknowledge and understand that and appreciate it and value it seriously, it also doesn't necessarily need to make us sad at all and can actually be a time of joy. So I guess let's get started and, and try to build that up and, and see how that works. Because if we're going to try to just emphasize the joy and the happiness and disregard the fact that sad things did happen and that, look, there's no running away from the fact that Shulchan Aruch, the, the first, you know, the first place that a Yid looks to know how to behave, what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to say, and sometimes even what we're supposed to think, the first place we look is Shulchan Aruch. There's no two ways about that. And Shulchan Aruch says that the way that we behave in this time is a way in which we commemorate sadness. So together with that, I, I, the, the point that I want to get to is to make sure that we, we understand that we're not flipping that off and we're not disregarding that. We're acknowledging that and respecting that. What we're going to understand is how together with that, there is a second half of the picture in which that sadness can go together with actually feeling happy at this time. It's possible to understand and appreciate the gravity of what happened and at the same time actually feel happy as a Yid who cares about Yerushalayim and cares about the Beis Amidosh and cares about Mashiach. And to understand how the three weeks are specifically are a time in which we should be particularly happy and joyous once we get how it all works. So I want to start, there's a story in Gemara that Rabbi Akiva was together with some of his colleagues and long story short they end up at the Harabais and they see a fox walking around in a place where the Beis Amidosh had been and everyone except for Rabbi Akiva started crying understandably the Beis Amidosh had just been destroyed and here in the holiest place in the world in a place where you even brought Karbonus where we had the Kodesh HaKadoshim where we had the Oren we had the Luchos we brought Torah on Yom Kippur and now there's a fox running around. They all burst out crying. Rabbi Akiva starts to laugh. <laughs> so everybody turns around. All his colleagues look at Rabbi Akiva and say, what, 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 what? Please explain. So Rabbi Akiva says, listen, we have Nevoas. We have prophecies that talk about the third base of Mikdash and Mashiach and Asid Lavoi and all the good things we know that are, that are coming at the end. And I never knew, like, if that's ever going to happen. Maybe we'll just continue having the base of English. The base of English was destroyed. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But now that the Nevois, there were also prophecies about the destruction. There were prophecies about foxes walking around in the place of the, where the base of English was, where the Kodesh HaKadoshim was. And Rabbi Akiva says, now that I saw the destruction that was in the prophecies that was in that the Navim talked about. And I see the foxes walking around in the Harabais like the Navim talked about. Now I see and understand that the Navuas are true, that what the prophets said is true and it comes to pass for real. I've seen with my own eyes that prophecies that I always learnt about 
and always believed and hoped to be true, but had never seen it with my own eyes. Now I've seen it with my own eyes. Now I know that prophecies come true. Now I know that the third base of English is going to be rebuilt, is going to be built, that the base of English will be rebuilt, the third base of English will be built. And I'm laughing, I'm happy, I'm stoked. His colleagues said to him, Akiva, you, you comforted us. Nicham Tonu, you made us feel better. But the thing that's very important here, we have to understand there are two different reactions that happened here, right? Their reaction made sense, right? They were very sad. The base of Midash got destroyed. There's foxes walking around in the Harabais. Terrible, terrible. And so when Rabbi Akiva reminds them, by the way, just remember that this what we just saw was a validation of the Nevois. It's a validation of the Nevim, of the prophecies. So now we know that and can have evidence of the fact that the prophecies that the Nevim told us do come to pass. And we know the third base of English will be rebuilt. So they said, you've comforted us. We're not crying anymore. You made us feel better. That Fine, that makes sense. But the question becomes, why was Rabbi Akiva laughing? To say that you've comforted us and you made us feel better, we were all sad and depressed and worried and upset. And now we realize it's not as bad as we thought. So we feel better. You comforted us. That makes sense. But why was Rabbi Akiva laughing? Something bad happened. He explained how the fact that the bad thing happened is evidence of the fact that something good is going to happen to balance it out. To cancel out the bad thing that happened. The base of English will be built again. Don't worry, we're going to have the base of English back. Fine, you can't. Why is that something to laugh about? It would have been better if this never would have happened and the base of English would have never been destroyed. What, what's there to laugh about? What's so exciting about this? We much prefer never been destroyed. We don't have to worry about the divorce, about it being rebuilt, and everybody's happy. Right? So obviously, there's more. When Rabbi Akiva was laughing, he was excited. The base of English was destroyed. Yes, it was destroyed. The foxes are running around. This is good. Rabbi Akiva didn't say, it's fine, we know it will come back. He was laughing. This was a positive experience for him. Which means that somehow, the third base of Mikdash is exciting enough to Rabbi Akiva that it would make him excited about the fact that the second one was destroyed and there were foxes running around in order to get to the third one. If the third base of Migdosh was going to be just a replacement of the second base of Migdosh, so what are you laughing about? It's not good. Yeah, it's going to come back, but meanwhile it's not here, is it? Do we have a base of Migdosh? No. There are foxes on the Harabais. So it's going to come back in some point in the future? Shkoyach, excellent. Thank you very much. What about now? you we'll still be crying. The bottom line is right now we don't have a base of Migdosh. What are you laughing about? So there's obviously something else in this picture that made Rabbi Akiva laugh. It's not just oh, it will come back, it will be replaced, we'll have the Beis Amigdosh, we'll bring Korbanos, we'll have Yom Tov in Yerushalayim, the whole Kali Yisrael will come together in Yerushalayim and it'll be beautiful. There's a lot more to it than just that, because if that's all it is, it's a pretty bad deal. So, I'm going to read now from a Medrash. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Medrash Yalkut Shemaini. Just one line. The Medrash says, Omar, Omar Rav. Rav says, Ola Arya Bamazal Arya Vehechreves Ariel. Ola Arya, a lion arose, Bamazal Arya in the muzzle of Arya, which is Chedish of. The Midrash continues that the Arya, the lion who arose is Nebuchad Netzar, Bamazal Arya in Chedish of. Vehechreves Ariel and destroyed the Mizbeach, destroyed the base of Midrash. Almanas in order, Sheyove Arya Bamazal Arya Vehivne Es Ariel. Nebuchadnezzar came in Chodesh of to destroy the Beis Amigdash so that another lion, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a lion is also a metaphor for Hashem, will come in the month of Arya in Chodesh of Yivne Esariel and build the Beis Amigdash and build the Mizbeach. Now there's two very important words here. It says Almanas, in order. Hashem allowed Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the base of Migdash in order that Hashem should be able to build the third base of Migdash, to rebuild it. What do you mean, in order? If someone says, loan me $1,000 for a month in order that I'll pay it back to you in a month. You don't loan someone money 
in order that they'll pay it back. You give them the money because you know what? They'll pay it back fine. In order means you're doing the first action. If you're doing something in order to have an outcome, that means that the reason you want to do this action is because it's in order to get something that you want, which means that the outcome that you're aiming for makes it worth taking the action that you're doing. Hashem allowed Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the base of Mindosh in order that Hashem should rebuild it. It doesn't say Hashem allowed him to destroy it because Hashem knew he was going to rebuild it anyway. That's not what it says. It says in order. Right? If someone comes to you and says, listen, give me a thousand dollars. I have this business idea. I can turn your thousand dollars today into a million dollars in 30 days. Now, obviously, if someone says that to you, you should probably tell them to go take a walk. But let's just imagine hypothetically that this was real and you knew that it was legit and it was actually going to happen. This person has some crazy idea where every dollar gets multiplied by a thousand. They said, listen, I have this this business idea, I can turn $2,000 into $2 million in 30 days. But I only have $1,000 and I can't start the project unless I have two. So I have 1,000, you partner with me, you give me 1,000, we'll have 2,000, in 30 days we'll have 2 million, you'll get a million, I'll get a million. What the person says to you is, give me $1,000, I'll menace in order that in 30 days you're going to get a million dollars back. That's a pretty good deal. No one says, Give me a thousand dollars, Almanas, so th because you're giving it to me in order that I should pay it back. If someone says that to you, they may use that wording, but it means they don't have an excellent command of English, let's say. Right now, it, let's, it, that's not to say that a loan is a bad thing. If someone comes and says, listen, can I please borrow a thousand dollars? I'll pay you back in 30 days. I'll give you back your thousand dollars. hundred percent. It's a mitzvah, as I say, minatoya. It's a mitzvah der so to loan money to someone when they need it. It's a good thing. I'm not saying a loan isn't a good thing. But a loan is not almanas. There's a loan and there's an investment. It's two different things. You give someone a loan as a favor. You don't give a loan in order to get your money back. You make an investment in order to make a profit. Right? If someone says, give me $1,000 and in 30 days you're going to get $5,000, and they come back in 30 days and give you back your thousand dollars, chances are you're going to be very disappointed. You know, I, I could have done other things with those thousand dollars in this time. I could have spent it. I could have invested it in somewhere else. I missed out on my money for, for 30 days. I, I didn't have access to my thousand dollars. The reason I did it was because you told me I'd get back five and now you give me back a thousand dollars. That's not a good investment. A loan is a loan and a loan is a good thing and it's a mitzvah and it's a very admirable thing. And giving someone a loan to help them, you know, get started is perhaps one of the biggest mitzvahs and biggest tovahs you can ever do for someone. But it's not an investment. At least it's not a financial investment. So when the Medrash says that Hashem allowed Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the second base of Migdosh, in order that there should be the third base of Migdosh, that's an investment. That means there's something about the third base of Migdosh which makes the destruction of the second base of Migdosh worthwhile. And not just the destruction of the second base of Migdosh, it makes the destruction of the second base of Migdosh worthwhile. It makes foxes running around in the Harabais worthwhile. And keep in mind that when the second base of Migdosh was destroyed, the Abishter knew exactly everything that was going to happen to Klai Yisrael for 2,000 years. The pain, the suffering, all the things that we have gone through for 2,000 years. The Abishter knew every single detail. And the Abishter allowed all of that to happen, al manas, in order that the third base of Migdosh should be rebuilt. al manas means it's an investment. Which means that the Abishta allowing the base of Migdosh. So Rabbi Akiva had this appreciation now. Rabbi Akiva understood that the third base of Migdosh, if the Medrash says that Hashem allowed the second base, Hashem didn't allow the second base of Migdosh to be destroyed because he knew he would rebuild it anyway. It doesn't say that. It says in order. It was an investment. Hashem invested, Hashem invested the value of the Beis HaMikdash and Golos and allowed for all of that to happen in order to reap the benefits, in order to have the profit that's going to be generated by it. In order to get the third Beis HaMikdash. Now, 
just coming back now, I want to talk about the two sides of this coin. Because Let, let's keep going for a minute. Let's go with, and I, I think that an investment really is, a financial investment is, is a very, very good metaphor for this. It's a very good marshal because it, it really carries both sides of the coin. It carries the halachic side as well as the other side, the second side, the side of the premier satora. Shulchan Aruch says, halacha says, that in the three weeks, we don't listen to music, we don't take haircuts, in the nine days, we don't drink wine and eat meat. We are commemorating the sad things that happened. The destruction of the second base of Mikdash was a sad thing. Rabbi Akiva didn't say that it's good that there is no base of Mikdash right now. He didn't say that. The reason he laughed was because he understood and appreciated the value of what was to come and the fact that what is happening now. So the question is, if what is to come, just because we're going to have something good in the future, why does that mean that now that things are bad, it's a good thing? And the answer is because that's the nature of investment. Right? And, and to clarify, look at, look at it this way. Imagine that you, sit, you walk into a friend's house or your friend, someone calls you on the phone and you're chatting and they tell you, you know what? Someone came by this week, it's legit. And just again, obviously in the real world, it doesn't work this way. But let's just imagine for the sake of argument and to illustrate the point that this was real and it was obviously this is a massive oversimplification and it's not realistic. But just imagine for argument's sake that your friend, your cousin, your sister, your someone tells you that, you know what? Someone just came by and offered me this opportunity. They said that they, the, go back to the idea we had before, they have a business opportunity to invest $2,000 and in 30 days the $2,000 becomes $2 million. They had $1,000 but it's only $2,000, not one and not three. It has to be two. And they had one and they came to me and offered me to be the second thousand dollars. I gave them my second thousand. I gave them a thousand dollars. 30 days, I'm going to get a million dollars back. It would be reasonable for you to feel something in the lines of, oh boy, I wish I had that chance. If only they offered me the opportunity. Or let's say they needed $5,000 and they were looking for four more people. They had a thousand, they needed four more. The person you're speaking to gave the second and you're not sure what's going on and you call them up and you say, hey, hey, can I be a part of it? I got your number. My, my friend told me that you're looking for investments of $1,000. Do you need 5,000 to become 5 million? And can I give you $1,000 and be part of the deal? And the person says, sorry, I just found five people. I got $5,000. It's too late. Maybe next time it would be reasonable for you to feel pretty disappointed. Just lost out on opportunity to just invest your thousand dollars for 30 days, come back with a million. You need the thirty dollars, you could easily borrow, you need the thousand dollars for those 30 days, you could easily borrow it from someone else and pay a high interest rate and you'll still be laughing all the way to the bank in 30 days. So now you missed out on this opportunity, the person you're speaking to got a chance to participate and you just missed out so what happened? You missed out on the opportunity to invest and now you have a thousand dollars in your pocket. And if you would have had the chance to invest, you wouldn't have had the thousand dollars in your pocket anymore. You would have had no money in your pocket. If let's say that you have exactly a thousand dollars in your pocket. So now you're disappointed that you still have a thousand dollars in your pocket. Why? Because you want to not have a thousand dollars in your pocket. Why? Because if you would have had the opportunity to not have the thousand dollars in your pocket for 30 days, in 30 days you have a million. That's pretty disappointing. You feel very disappointed to still have a thousand dollars in your pocket right now. And just imagine if that person calls you back 60 seconds later and says, you know what? One person just backed out. I've got one spot left. Do you want that spot? Just imagine how excited you would be right now that you got that chance to not have your thousand dollars for 30 days. Very excited. You're going to be laughing and dancing and screaming all day and all night long. Why? Because I don't have my thousand dollars anymore. I gave away my thousand dollars. I don't have access to my thousand dollars for 30 days. Why is that something to be excited about? Because it wasn't a loan. I didn't lose it. It was an investment. And if I hadn't had the chance to give it away, I wouldn't have been able to make, to make the extra 990,000 that rounds it up, 999,000 that turns it into a million. 
So that doesn't change the fact that for 30 days you don't have access to that money. And let's say, just to illustrate, that there are, there's no borrowing. You have no way to borrow $1,000 for the next month. It's impossible. You have no way to borrow money and you just gave away every penny in your pocket. For 30 days, you don't have a penny. For 30 days, you're going to have to ask people to give you food. For 30 days, anything you need, you're going to have to go and ask someone for it. Everything. You don't have a penny to your name. You've got no credit card. You've got no debit card. You've got no cash. There's no loans. It's not necessarily going to be the most fun 30 days of your life. But you are going to be at the same time as for those 30 days, you're not going to have access to that money. It doesn't change. The fact that in 30 days you get a million doesn't change the fact that for 30 days you have no money. For 30 days you're flat broke, you've got no money, no loans, no credit, nothing. It doesn't change that. But it does justify it. So on one hand, you can recognize that this is a difficult time. I'm flat broke. I don't have one cent to my name. I need to eat three times a day. I need to make Shabbos. Maybe I need to buy some new clothes. I have things that I need and I have not a penny to my name and no way to get money. I have to beg for anything that I want the next 30 days. It's not good. But is it worth it? Are you happy if someone would say you could take your thirty, you could take your thousand dollars now and back out of the investment? Of course not. I'll be very happy to beg for thirty days if I get a million dollars at the end of the thirty days. If all I, if I gave away a thousand now, and other if you could give me the chance, if I had more and you could give me the chance to invest more, I'd do more. I'd do whatever I could because if every thousand gets multiplied by a thousand, be laughing all the way to the bank. Right? Because that's the nature of investment. That's why it's called invest. You're putting it in to something so that it can grow and return a profit. Now, the fact that it's worthwhile and it justifies it doesn't mean that you're not missing that money in the meantime. You are. You invested the money. The reason why a lot of people don't invest their money is maybe they don't understand and haven't been sufficiently informed and or educated and maybe they just have too strong an attachment to spending their money now and they just are not you know they, they don't value the benefit of investing enough to stop spending so that they'll have money left to invest why because the fact is that if you're investing you don't have the cash to spend it's tied up in an investment there are two sides to the coin right investing money means that you can't spend it now but it's worth it and it justifies it, which is why you do it. And this is Rabbi Akiva was looking at the destruction of the base of English and at the foxes in the Harabais with an investment mindset. Rabbi Akiva said the Abishta allowed this to happen. Al Manas, why? It's an investment. He did it so that he could be able to have the third base of English. Now, Let's come back to the investment marshal again for a minute. Let's say that you don't know the full picture. All right, someone else doesn't know. You do. You just invested your thousand dollars and you know that in 30 days it becomes a million. And someone else walks into the room and they see that you're all excited and they ask you why you're so excited. And you say, well, I had a thousand dollars in my pocket this morning and it's gone. I don't have it anymore. I gave it to someone. I don't have any money left. I'm so excited. And they look at you a little bit strangely and say, okay, is there something I'm missing and what's going on? And so you say, yeah, there is. It was an investment and I'm going to be getting back more than $1,000 at the end of the 30 days. Now, if the person looks at you and has no idea what you're getting back, they have no way to know what you're getting back. If they see that you're dancing and jumping for joy and excited and you can't fall asleep and you can't concentrate or anything, you're so excited that you don't have your money, they're probably going to assume you're getting back more than $1,005. Your return on that investment is going to be more than $5 at the end of 30 days. They're probably going to assume considering that you're jumping for joy. Now, they might not assume it's a million because it wouldn't take a million, it wouldn't take, you know, a, a, a thousand to one profit 
to justify giving away a thousand dollars for thirty days. You know, give a, a, a thousand. I'd invest a thousand dollars for thirty days for a lot less than a million dollars back. But let's say, so the person who knows what they'll guess. Maybe they'll guess you're going to double your money in thirty days. I don't know. They make five hundred dollars profit, two thousand, whatever. If you tell the person I had a thousand dollars in my pocket and now I have none. And they say, what did you do? I invested. I gave it to someone to invest for me and put it away in an investment <coughs> for 50 years. I'm getting the money back in 50 years with the return, with the profit. And there's a guaranteed profit to justify it. And you're jumping for joy. That person doesn't think that you're making a $500 profit on your $1,000 on a 30-year investment and it's making you jump for joy or 50 years. Because no one's putting away $1,000 to make $500 profit over 50 years and jumping for joy about it. There's not an investment that makes you jump for joy. If you put $1,000 away for 50 years and you're jumping for joy of the opportunity, anybody who walks in and has that is enough. Just knowing your investment was for 50 years, was $1,000 and you're jumping for joy, that's enough information to know that the profit on this investment is going to be very, very big. It's not to get back $500, it's not to get back $1,000. You're not jumping for joy that over 50 years that you're not going to have access to this money, it's going to double into $2,000. That wouldn't make you jump for joy. Putting it away for 50 years, it's going to be a lot more than double if you're jumping for joy about it. So Rabbi Akiva understood the Abishter is allowed the base Amidosh to be destroyed and not only destroyed now, there are foxes crawling around in the Harabais, in the Kodesh HaKadashim. And everything that David knew was going to happen over the next 2,000 years, all of that was Kadai, all of that. Al Manas, it was an investment in order. Shiyavi Arya Bamazal Arya Vivnes Ariel, that the Abishta will come and build the third base on It's an investment. The Abishta only allowed it to happen not because it would be repaired, but because it's worth it in order to get what we're going to have. It's in order to get to the destination where we're going. What we're going to have is valuable enough to make it worthwhile to destroy what we already had and to suffer in the interim. That's how good it is. It's an investment. It's not a loan. You're not getting back what you gave. You're getting back a lot more to the extent that it makes it worthwhile. And now going back to what we were talking about before about first let's, let's go in a different direction for a couple of minutes. So the question is then, what exactly is this value? Right? What, what are we going to have when the third base we have the third base amigdosh that justifies the destruction? Third base amigdosh is going to be forever. It's never going to be destroyed. That sounds nice, okay. And Hashem could have made the second base amigdosh never be destroyed either. Right? Hashem could have not allowed the second base amigdosh to be destroyed. And they say, because Hashem could have made the second base amigdosh never be destroyed, but He did allow it to be destroyed. Why? So that we would have the third base amigdosh which will never be destroyed. That's not a good investment. Same thing. Don't let the second one be destroyed and you have something that never got destroyed and you're back to where you started with. What, what did you gain by allowing it to be destroyed? To get back something that will never be destroyed. So obviously there's more to the picture than that. There's a lot more to the picture than that. You know, the, there's, there's talk... In, in the Midrashim and, and Sfarim about when Mashiach comes, you know, that we're not going to be interested in the things that we're interested in today. When Mashiach comes in Yemosa Mashiach Asid Lave, we're not going to be interested in food, cars, houses, all these things. And obviously we all understand today that ideally we should be more inspired etc than to be interested in these things and to pursue these things obviously we need to eat but you know there are levels of being invested in food among all other interests but like let's be real we all have things that we like i can speak for myself i have things that i like other than just Torah and mitzvahs Con confession over so, when Mashiach comes, you're going to completely lose interest in all of those things. You know, and a lot of people hear that and it's like, well, I, I don't know, like, you're telling me that Mashiach is exciting and I should be looking forward to Mashiach. And then you tell me when Mashiach comes, I'm going to lose interest in all the things I'm interested in. <laughs> I, I kind of just lost interest in Mashiach, to be frank. 
I, I'm not so sure that I want to lose interest in all the things in life that give me pleasure. What's exciting about that? But that's based on a complete and total misunderstanding of what that means. There's no safer that says that when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to flick a switch and He's going to turn off all your sense of interest and pleasure in, in, in the material world in Olam Hazar. It doesn't say that anywhere. What's going to happen? I remember still my, our first daughter, she, when she was like one and a half years old, she was the first, daughter, first child in our home. And we don't have much junk food at home, we never did. And so she, you know, she ate pretty healthy. She had never really been exposed to candy and nush and anything like that. And I, I don't remember why. I'm trying to think of what would have been the reason to have done this. But for whatever reason, one day I was giving her a lollipop. I took a lollipop out of the wrapper and gave it to her. And she literally, I still remember, clear as day, she didn't know what to do with it. She's holding it and looking at it. Didn't know what to do with it. I was like, eat it, lick it. And she was like, I don't know. I took the lollipop and touched it to her tongue. Boom. The rest is history. It never came out of her mouth. The stick came out of the mouth when it was empty. And any time since then, guaranteed she sees a lollipop is going straight in her mouth. At a Yomazan. Until today. So what changed? She's looking at a lollipop and she didn't know what it was. You could tell her to put it in her mouth. And she's like, why would I put it in my mouth? Like, what's the point of like taking some colored circle? For all she knows, it's a piece of Lego on a stick. I don't know. Telling me to take a circle, colored piece of circle, and put it in my mouth. For what? Touch it on her tongue. Now, as if I state, now she understands exactly why she wants to put it in her mouth. Why? Because she experienced it. And she's one, and one and a half, and two, and three, and four, and five. A lollipop's lollipop. Sees a lollipop, goes running for it. If you go to a one and a half year old child who just tasted their first lollipop, or their second or third lollipop, and then you come to them, this one and a half year old child, and you say, you know what? You could have a lollipop, or a hundred dollar bill, which one do you want? Well, no brainer, every kid is going for the lollipop. I, if they don't take the lollipop and they take the hundred dollar bill, they could buy a year supply of lollipops instead of one lollipop. Shkoyach, does a one and a half year old kid understand what money is, what cash is, how it works, the nature of transactions? No, obviously not. So the one and a half year old kid's gonna take the lollipop instead of the hundred dollar bill. Kid gets a little bit older, I don't know, six, seven, eight. And you come to them with a lollipop and their eyes light up and you say, uh, but you have two options here. It's your choice. Here's a lollipop. Here's a piece of paper. See this piece of paper? It's a hundred dollar bill. If you take this paper to the store, you give it to them, they'll give you a year supply of lollipops, a thousand lollipops, probably more than a thousand, probably 20,000 lollipops. I don't know, whatever it is, a lot of lollipops. As the kids are old enough to understand, oh, that makes sense. They take the hundred dollars. They're not going to take the lollipop. Why would they take one lollipop if they can have two thousand, five thousand lollipops? They take the hundred dollars and go buy the lollipops. So what happened? Did the child now take the hundred dollar bill? Mm. It's not a perfect muscle because it's still lollipops. Um, okay, let's take. Let's make it an eight-year-old girl, and she. Th there's a doll that she really wants an expensive doll that she wants that she saw her friend had it it's an american girl doll face costs a hundred bucks and she wants it but she also wants a lollipop so you say to her here it's a lollipop or a hundred dollar bill take the hundred dollar bill you can go buy an american girl doll lollipop or hundred dollar bill she's been desperately wanting this doll that she sees her friend in school has for years forget the lollipop give me the hundred bucks so what happened is the reason that they didn't even look at the lollipop and they jumped for the hundred dollar bill is that because you made them not like lollipops anymore. No, you didn't make them not like lollipops anymore. They still like lollipops. And if you'd offer them both, they'd probably take both. But if it's a lollipop or a hundred dollar bill to go buy the doll they've been begging to have for five years, of course they're going to take the hundred dollar bill. Lolli one lollipop, which they can get any time they have a quarter available, or, or, or the doll that's a hundred dollars, they're going to take the doll. And this is a very close metaphor, lahavdil, for what happens when Mashiach comes. Right, Rambam says, you know, there's a lot that we know about when Mashiach comes. A lot of things we know. We have Psukim and Chazal and Medrashim, all different things about when Mashiach comes. But most of the things, almost all the things we know about when Mashiach comes, they don't tell us what defines Yemosa Mashiach. What is it that defines the difference between Golos and Yemosa Mashiach? Vagar Zeevim Keves, the wolf lying with the lamb, doesn't define the difference 
between Golos and Yomos HaMashiach. It's one of the things that will happen. It's a symptom of Yomos HaMashiach. It's not the definition. You want to know what the definition? What's going to define the, the distinction between Golos and Yomos HaMashiach? Rambam tells us very simple. It's the end of the whole Rambam. The whole Mishnah Torah, people who learn Rambam. One and three prokim a day, just finished, just learned this. Rambam says, well, it's not Rambam's Chiddush, Rambam quotes a pasuk from the Navi. It says, when Yomais HaMashiach is defined by the fact that the world will be filled with recognition of Hashem, as the water covers the seabed. The seabed doesn't know that there's air in the sky out there. The seabed has hundreds, thousands of feet of water above it. It's just water, water, water everywhere. Water, fish, underwater world. The seabed is under a world of water. It's a universe of water. Its entire reality is just water. And that's going to be us. Our reality is going to be just filled with awareness of Hashem. Right? We all know there's a lot we know about Hashem. And we know how we're supposed to feel about Hashem. And if we're lucky, we get to feel that a little bit. We get to feel some Abbas Hashem, and we get to feel some Yerushalayim, and we get to really be emotionally involved in the, in the absolute truth of, of, of the Creator, of infinity, of Torah, of mitzvahs. If we're lucky, and if we work hard, and we're lucky. But the fact that we struggle to really experience that, it's not because it's not real. It's because it's hard to be tuned into it. It's very difficult to be tuned into that. We all know it's the truth. We all know it's there. But the Abishta made us intentionally, you know, majority, consciously, the majority of, of what we feel openly comes from the Yetzirah Harah, from the Nefshah Bahamis. And then there's the Yetzirah Tov and Nefshah Lekis also. Really, the Nefshah Lekis is our true identity, but it has to go through the Nefshah Bahamis. So it's not so easy, but we know it's a truth. Now, if you know something's true and you struggle to be in touch with that truth, you can understand that ultimately, ideally, it would be better to be in touch with that truth and to see it and to feel it. And to not just know it up here and struggle with the fact that we know it, but we don't feel it. Or we feel it a bit and we wish we felt it more and we struggle with things that are opposing that all the time. And there's tension and struggle in life. Imagine if Malah Haaretz Deya Es Hashem, the world was filled with recognition of Hashem. Everywhere you look, you see purpose, you see meaning, you see purpose in a chair. You look at a tree, you look at a blanket of grass, you see purpose, you see meaning, you see infinity. You see divinity, you see Hashem everywhere and everything. And you understand that you are a part of that infinity and you are a part of that divinity and you have a part of Hashem in you and this infinite meaning and purpose that exists in everything. You're a part of that and you can make a difference and contribute to it. And everything exists as part of this picture of infinity and divinity. Think you're going to be interested in a steak and a milkshake? Or a new paint coat of paint on your house? Not so much. Why? Not because anyone's going to take it away from you. Not because Hashem's going to flick a switch that turns off your interest. It's because you're going to have something that's so infinitely more valuable and not infinitely more valuable in the Sfarim and not infinitely more valuable in the calculations in your head. We're going to get to see it and to feel it. That's the whole definition of Yomais HaMashiach. Malah Haaretz Deya Es Hashem. The world will be filled with recognition of Hashem. We'll see purpose, meaning, infinity, divinity everywhere and everything and we'll see how we're a part of that. That's going to be our experience every second of every day. Of course we're not going to be interested in trivial things that we get carried away in now. Of course not. Ridiculous. And so that's just a little taste. You know, in, this, in the times of the first two Botemigdash, they didn't have that. There was a Gilui. There were revelations of Elikus and miracles in the Botemigdash, etc. Particularly in the first base Amigdash. It wasn't Malahar's Day as Hashem the way that it will be when Mashiach comes. Not even close. 
When Mashiach comes, it says, the Navi says, Varol kol basar ki Hashem diber. We're going to look, our eyes will see the Dvar Hashem, the word of Hashem, Yehi Ur, etc., that makes everything exist. We're going to see that everywhere. That never happened before. The third base of Mikdash, Yom Yisrael Mashiach, is going to be a whole different ballgame to the first two Bate Mikdash. And Rabbi Akiva said, yes, amazing, this is so exciting, I'm laughing. Why? Because the Nevoah came true. The second base of Mikdash was destroyed and there are foxes running around. This is such good news, Rabbi Akiva said, I'm laughing. Why? Because now I know that we're going to get the third base of Mikdash and Mashiach, which is going to be so unimaginably amazing even as an experience not just hypothetically but what we're going to feel and experience our conscious experience is going to be so incredible we'll lose interest in anything else it's going to be so amazing it totally makes it worthwhile to lose the second base of Mikdash and have foxes crawling around here this is an investment it's al manas Hashem allowed the second base of Mikdash to be destroyed in order to get the third one because that's how good it's going to be I want to read a, a little passage from Zoyar. So it's, it's based around a Pasuk in Tehillim. The Pasuk says, there's actually a, be, uh, a beautiful a cappella song about this Pasuk that went around a few years ago. It got millions and millions of views online um, by one of the Hamish a cappella choirs. The Pasuk says, If Hashem won't build the house, Shav Amlu Voinov Voi. Voinov, those who built it, they built it in vain. And what does that mean? Zara is going to explain. So the, the Zara says, The Ovesa Ismene Ayyadad Devar Nash. A base Amigosh that's built by man, i.e., the first two, built by the Yidden, by Klau Yisrael, physically by hand. Ovigin Kachla Iskayam, and therefore they, they didn't last forever. They were not Kayam forever. They were destroyed. Oh, Shlomo Havayana. Shlomo knew that. Shlomo knew that the base of English that he was building was not going to be eternal. It wasn't going to last forever. He knew that this handmade work built by mankind, built by people, it can't last forever. And this is why he says, If Hashem doesn't build the house, if it's built by us, anything that's man-made cannot be eternal. Anything that's man-made by definition will deteriorate over time and will have an end point. Because we are not infinite and we can't create something infinite. If man creates it, it will have an end. And that's why it says, If Hashem doesn't build the base of English, if we build it, Shav, for nothing, Om They built it for nothing. Why? It's going to end up being destroyed. Obviously, for nothing is perhaps hyperbolic. It's a little bit strong. We still had it for as long as we had it. But in the bigger picture, in the long run, it's not going to last. It was not eternal. And the Zohar continues, To date, there has never been one building that was handmade by Hashem Himself. Every building, including the first two parts of English, were man-made and they didn't last. It says in the Apostle, Hashem. Hashem builds Yerushalayim. Hashem and no one else. And that third base of Mikdash that we're waiting for, that's what we're waiting for, a building built by Hashem. Not a man-made building, which is not eternal. The third base of Mikdash is going to be eternal, is going to last forever, not because Hashem's never going to allow it to be destroyed. Hashem could have never allowed the second base of Mikdash to be destroyed. Incidentally, He did, but He could have not. But the, if the reason that it wasn't destroyed was because it happened to not get destroyed, that doesn't mean that it's intrinsically eternal by definition. It just means it never got destroyed. The third base of Mikdash is not going to be around forever because Hashem won't let anyone destroy it. The third base of Mikdash is going to be Hashem's handiwork. It's going to be indestructible by definition. Hashem is infinite and everlasting. A base of Mikdash that's built by Hashem directly will be infinite and everlasting by definition. No one and nothing can destroy it. Third base of Mikdash is a whole different ballgame to the first two Bate Mikdash. And that base of Mikdash that's going to be built by Hashem, Hashem's own hands, and here it's going to be a physical building built by Hashem that will be eternal, is, that's the base of Mikdash is the center and perhaps the climax of the Geula which comes together with us looking around and seeing infinite meaning and purpose and divinity in everything, every book, every chair, every molecule of food, every cup of water, every tree, every blade of grass, every rock. We're going to see Hashem, infinite meaning and purpose in everything. 
that's the reality, reality we're going to experience. We're going to experience the absolute truth of Hashem everywhere. Everywhere you look, absolute truth of Hashem in front of your eyes. You're going to see it everywhere. We know that it's everywhere now. We don't get to see it. At best, if we're lucky and we do a lot of hard work, we get to see it a little bit figuratively with our mind's eye. Mashiach comes, we're going to see it with these eyes everywhere we look. It's going to be a whole different ball game. Hashem's, the Shechina is going to be revealed more than the Shechina. We're going to see Hashem Himself everywhere. We're going to have a base Amigdash that's going to be eternal, not because no one can destroy it, but because it's going to be infinite by definition. That's what we're going to have. And Rabbi Akiva understood that. And Rabbi Akiva said, yes, let's get the third base Amigdash. Let's make it happen. We're going to destroy the second base Amigdash. Let's do it. Beis Amigdash was just, obviously, I'm getting a bit hyperbolic here and carried away, but Rabbi Akiva was laughing. He said, yes, Beis Amigdash destroyed. Fox is running around. Amazing. Why? Because now we're going to get the third one. If not for this, we wouldn't have got the third Beis Amigdash. It's like the minute you get that phone call and the person says, you know what? I thought I was full and you were going to keep your $1,000. You know what? I have another spot open. I'll take your $1,000 off you. I'll take it away. Super excited, jumping for joy. Yay, I get to have my $1,000 taken away from me. Why? Because in 30 days, it's going to become a million. So Shiva Asa Batamuz and Tichabov, the three weeks, the nine days, the time when Hashem took away Yerushalayim as it was and took away the Beis Amigosh and, and the whole focus of, of Yiddish life that revolved around the Beis Amigdash, which is what it's supposed to be. And, and we lost that. And that was and continues to be catastrophic. It's not a question. It is. It is bad. And we do mourn and we do fast. But at the same time, we understand that this isn't just a loan. This is an investment. It's an opportunity. Hashem allowed all of this to happen al manas in order that we should be able to get to Mashiach because Mashiach is going to be something that not just in the books, but in our conscious experience, in what we see and hear and feel and taste and smell, is going to be so unimaginably incredible. We will lose interest in everything and we will celebrate the day that it was made possible through the destruction of the second base of Midrash and the running around of a fox on the Harabais. That's what Rabbi Akiva was laughing about. Rabbi Akiva was laughing because as bad as that moment was, it was well worth it, considering what it facilitated, what it made possible. If you don't give that $1,000 away to the investment, you're not making profit. You have $1,000 now, you'll have it left at the end of the month. You spend $500, you'll have $500 left. You spend the whole thing, you'll have nothing left. You'll have stuff that you bought with it. You get to give the whole $1,000 away to someone right now, you have no money. It didn't change. It is The next 30 days are going to be very difficult. They are. It's going to be worth it and you'll tolerate it happily, basimcha, with joy because you know that at the end of the 30 days you're going to get a million. But that doesn't change the fact that the 30 days are going to be physically difficult without any money. So Golos is difficult. It doesn't change. Golos is difficult and it's sad. And the fact that we don't have the base of now is catastrophic. It's terrible. And that's why we have Shiva Sabatamas the way we do and we have Tisha B'av the way that we do in the three weeks and the nine days. That it's, we're not saying that that's not real. But if we understand that all of that was an investment, al manas in order to make the third base of Midrash and Yemais Mashiach were a possibility, and without the destruction of the second base of Midrash, we would still have it today. We wouldn't even... This, the, in Mashiach and the third base of Midrash and Yemais Mashiach and the Lavei, Tchiyas HaMesim and all of that wouldn't be on the table, Bukhlau, because we'd still be having the second base of Midrash. We'd be stuck there. So it's sad to not have that. But when we understand that the moment the Beis HaMikdash was taken away was the moment that we got that phone call that said, you can now participate, you have the opportunity to make that investment and to go through a period of time that's going to be sad and difficult and terrible. But this is an opportunity to make an investment that will give you a profit that is going to be so unimaginably valuable and amazing, incredible, that it makes this the best op investment opportunity that you could ever imagine. Jumping for joy when you get that phone call. And Rabbi Akiva was doing the same thing. Rabbi Akiva was laughing. So the three weeks are sad. But at the same time, they're sad because right now it's difficult. We lost the base of Midrash. We don't have the base of Midrash. And we, we don't have half of the mitzvahs in the Torah. 
all the mitzvahs that revolve around Karbonos and Kohanim and Levim and the mitzvahs about Eretz Yisrael that only apply in the time of the base. I mean, just we're missing you know, half the mitzvahs in the Torah. We don't get to, to fulfill, to be Mekayim. It's not, it's not good. That is objectively bad. It's an objectively bad thing. It is. But it's also an investment and it's worth it. It was worth it as far as Hashem decided it was worth it. And Rabbi Akiva understood that and he laughed because he saw the value. He saw this not as a loss and not even as a loan, but as an investment. An investment that was going to return such a valuable profit that it made it worthwhile. Not having that money for those 30 days is worth it to get the million at the end. Just imagine how much you'd have to get back. Or just imagine what we are going... And Hashem doesn't do it for Himself. Hashem does it for us. Just imagine what the experience of Yomais Mashiach and the Beis Amidosh is going to be. Lassid Lavi. Should be taken from Yad Mamash. It shouldn't be Lassid Yad Lavi anymore. Imagine what that's going to be. That it's going to be something that made it well worth Hashem's while to allow the destruction of the Beis Amidosh and foxes running around on the Harabais and whatever else is there now, La Havdil. And 2,000 years of suffering of the Eden, all in order to have that. And, and you know, what we have gone through has been terrible, uh, un- indescribably terrible. Which means that whatever, somehow, in some way that we can't understand or fathom, Mashiach and Yemosa Mashiach and the Asilava is going to be enough to make all of that somehow an investment. That's what Rabbi Kibbutz was laughing about. So we can take this time seriously and mourn the fact that we don't have the base of Mingdosh now. But at the same time, be truly Basimcha and, and not a frivolous Simcha, a, a real Simcha that comes from the Neshama and from Torah, knowing that all of this is the process that allows us to be able to be in a position to get to Yomosa Mashiach, to get to the Beis Amidosh, to get to the Beis Amidosh that's not man-made, it's built by Hashem and will be eternal by definition. There's no Tchiyas Amesim in the second Beis Amidosh scale. We're going to have it in the third Beis Amidosh. It's going to be a different ballgame. We're going to see infinite value, purpose, Hashem everywhere and everything. We're going to see it and feel it and taste it and smell it. And that's something that and we can, when we have both of those sides of the picture, we can take the time seriously, but at the same time understand that it really is a time of simcha. It really is something that if we can manage to wrap our heads around the bigger picture enough, obviously there's a limit to how much we can, but just to understand the concept and, you know, that Rabbi Akiva obviously understood and saw something that made him laugh. Imagine what it's going to be. Imagine how good it's going to be. And we are very close to that right now. We're 2,000 years closer than he was. Ish. And he was laughing about it then. We have a lot to be besimch about now. And uh, may it be, take from me, Ad Mamish, and it shouldn't be Lotus Love anymore, it should be the present.